invite Deepika to join Abhinav for a conversation where we discuss their life's work, experience with mental health and learning in the process of healing and growth. My childhood, I was a brat, I was naughty. That's, that's my memory of my childhood. But yes, I think my initial years started with a lot of... Um, it was very structured, it was very... I, liked, I, I would think like most other homes, uh, wake up in the morning, uh, go to school, come back, friends, play downstairs. Uh, both my sister and I were not into watching television or reading. For us, it was more about going downstairs and playing, uh, you know, in the building with our friends, playing cricket, playing hide and seek. Um, and then at some point in my life, I remember started, I started playing professional badminton and I think that's when my life changed a little bit. Um, because then as an athlete, uh, you know, you, you have a routine and you have uh, training. So my life started with 4.35 in the morning, you go for your first round of physical conditioning, come back. Um, I didn't get permission from school to sort of go late. Um, so I would finish my physical conditioning, come back home quickly, have a shower, have breakfast, run to school and just about make it in time for my first class. School would finish around 3.34, come back home, have a snack, again rush to the court uh, because this was the on-court session. Um, uh, throw in a massive uh, session for about for a couple of hours, come back, do homework, have dinner, crash. That was literally my schedule from Monday to Friday. Um, and Saturdays was, uh, I think, catching up with on homework, uh, occasionally maybe going out as a family. We didn't really go out much. Uh, we hardly watch very many movies. Um, and even eating out was sort of very streamlined and maybe once in a week we'd maybe go out to a restaurant. Um, yeah, and that was my life until I was about 16 and then board exams happened and then I realized that this is not what I wanted to do professionally and uh, that modeling and acting was my calling and and here I am now. For me it was uh, similar in many ways in terms of structure, it was uh, very regimented, uh, very, very structured but I think there was one, uh, one thing not uh, similar which was that as a young boy I hated sport. Oh. I was uh, this fat little boy whose only talent in life was to miss physical education classes at school. <laughs> uh, I was in a boarding school um, and I hated it there but I used to receive a letter from my father practically every day and it had one thing in common which was to play sport. Uh, of course I didn't listen to him um, and I finally got out of boarding school and uh, started going to a day school. Um, and that's where I got introduced to the sport of shooting. I was looking for just a pastime after, after school hours to do something and uh, a family friend introduced me to the sport of shooting and I went to my first formal shooting session and I loved it because to be successful in that sport I had to stand still right. and, and not really run around too much but that was of course the entry into the sport. To do well I had to also for make my, um, you know, my, my weak point a uh, uh, strength. Uh, but that's just the way it started. It was uh, a normal childhood. I saw my parents work very hard, so uh, that was the environment uh, I was uh, brought up in. And then I used to look up to them, you know, the amount of hard work they did in their professions. That was uh, something I learned from them. Um, as I said, I, I wasn't the most talented individual around. I was fat, I was uncoordinated, I was unathletic, I was uh, not competitive at all, but definitely I had one little talent, which was to work hard uh, and, and to persevere. And that's what I did. I used to go to school, school got over, came home quickly, I had lunch, and off I went for my, my shooting session. And that lasted till five, six in the evening, come home, do your homework, and, and go to bed and, and repeat. So that was my, that was my childhood. How did your father react to, because you mentioned you weren't a very sporting, so athletic person and he'd write to you almost every single day asking you to pursue a sport. So when your family friend introduced you to this and then he sort of saw the wheels churning and how did he react to that? 
Was he happy or was it pressure? Or? No, I think he was, my father was absolutely delighted because he, he came from a little bit of a sporting background, having played sport at the school level. My grandfather used to play hockey as well. So he always wanted to see his child play some sort of sport. Uh, I think. Professionally? No, just just play, sport. just play sport for the sheer joy of playing sport, and, and there was no real target set at, at on day one that you know you have to go to this. Those were my decisions I had to make. And while my parents really supported me through my long journey, and you know they supported me materially to to provide for me to to get me the adequate adequate training, but I believe their biggest contribution in my 20 odd years in sport uh, um, was to, uh, of course support me morally when I felt hopeless they continued to see a lot of hope in me and there, those were many days in my career where this hopelessness uh, was lingering around uh, and also the greatest contribution one of the greatest contributions uh, they made was they gave me the space to make my own decisions and to make my own mistakes uh, and that was critical that was critical for my growth over a period of time even though there were times when they would have thought differently they suggested something but never pushed me towards something. I had to own my successes and I had to own my failures. And that was uh, a great thing what they did and uh, you know whenever uh, parents come up to me and ask me how did your parents uh, do, uh, what did they do, I just uh, tell them you have to support your kids but you also have to give them the space uh, to develop because you know when you're in an Olympic final or when that moment of truth comes in an environment where which requires performance one thing is certain and that is that you're going to be all alone True. Uh, and you have to find that courage and that conviction yeah. from deep within uh, and that is a process it doesn't for some people it may come naturally uh, but for, for most uh, it is a learning and it is a journey that you have to uh, work your way through so I think that was the greatest contribution that my parents gave there they always created an environment of great positivity uh, to be very honest, I wasn't the most positive individual around. Uh, I was borderline negative, more realistic. Uh, uh, you know, I say that you know athletes. You know, you're an actor, and uh, I say that the athletes are the best con men and con women that uh, exist in the world because we have to con our minds every day in believing uh, into the fact that we are the best. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I started as a 13-year-old boy and uh, my first uh, goal in my life was to win a district competition. That was the purest goal that I ever had. And I achieved that and then, of course, there was a little bit of greed. Then, you know, I wanted to win the state championship and then the national championship. Uh, you know, I represented India for my first Commonwealth Games at the age of 15 and I was competing at the Olympic Games in, in, uh, in Sydney uh, at the age of 17. But really, it was my performance in Sydney which... Uh, gave me a little bit of belief that hey I can do this I can go go and and, and, and win this thing and it was that performance which Would you say was, that so casually you say that like I went into the Olympics I was 17 did was but was the journey actually that easy of course not. it was a, it was a lot of hard work I mean uh, right from a 13 year old boy I had to make several sacrifices you know I had no social life I I hardly had friends because um, at least from school because you know I would uh, go to school and then uh, right after that it was training 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 I packed my bags as a 13 year old with my with my mother and, and left for Germany uh, and lived there for, for, for many years and many months uh, in, to, train. In, to train in a little sports hostel which which was tough uh, in, in those days because there was absolutely no communication and we were not in the age of uh, um, the the internet and things like that so it was really difficult times but uh, it was something just it was a calling uh, it was something which came from deep uh, within my gut that this is what I want to do uh, and I can I can do this and um, one thing just led to the other quite organically early on and uh, of course uh, my parents pushed me uh, to continue to study as well uh, and that was a great thing uh, that they did was that I had to study so every time I traveled to competitions it was two hours of the day were assigned to, 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 to Study. studies. Um, and your school supported you? And my, I was very fortunate that my school was very, very supportive uh, at, at, a, at a very uh, young age. But uh, very young, I mean, this was very clear. At age 15, I wanted to go to the Olympic Games and one day I wanted to become Olympic champion. And that was, that clarity came in quite 
early on. It was a very lofty goal to have, I have to admit. It was supremely ambitious. Um, some, many people thought I was mad, and, uh, but that was okay. It was, it was added motivation, it was fueled. Uh, and you know, there were limiting factors. I was reminded of the fact that no Indian had ever won and we, we are not capable of winning gold medals at the Olympic Games. But again, I used that negativity, and there was plenty of it around. Uh, I, I used it in a positive way to, to push me, uh, and, and I wanted to be the first one. So it was, uh, it was added, added uh, motivation um, through it. And of course, the Sydney experience was a defining experience. Uh, and after that, I moved to the United States. I, I lived and studied again. I was studying, doing my bachelor's degree in business, and I, I was living in the US Olympic Training Center. Uh, to train for the 2004 Olympic Games. Um, I went there to the 2004 Olympic Games and perhaps it was my greatest failure as in terms of an outcome. Uh, you know, I was uh, somebody who was in, probably in the best shape of my life in 2004. Uh, I broke an Olympic record uh, in, in 2004, uh, entered the final in third place, but finished seventh and uh, I had to shoot 10 very ordinary shots, but just happened to shoot the worst 10 shots of my life. And that was heartbreaking and you know my world had come absolutely tumbling down. And another incredible story there, I met my mother five, five to ten minutes after this Olympic final and it was one of the two Olympics my parents and my sister had travelled to uh, and um, you know she comes up to me and I was all grumpy and almost in tears uh, and she comes up to me and says you know the most you could have won today was bronze or a silver but you're going to win a gold medal. It's going to happen in four years' time. I just shut up and uh, four years later, it actually happened. happened. So never argue with a mother's yeah. instinct. Uh, <laughs> this is my, one of my biggest learnings as well. Uh, and then, of course, you know, one thing led to the other. The, the Olympic Games in 2004 happened. That, you know, the Athens experience was a great failure, but it was a wonderful learning as well. Unt up until uh, 2004, I was very, very driven by an outcome. I was obsessed by the outcome. I wanted this gold medal, gold medal, gold medal. And this AdSense experience just um, helped me detach from outcomes. Uh, for me, the process became the goal. Right. Uh, it was about doing my best every single day. It was about uh, being better than what I was yesterday. Um, and I approached Beijing with a very different state of, in a very different state of mind. You know, I didn't care if I uh, won the gold medal or not. My goal was to live in the present moment. Uh, I had 70 opportunities, uh, in my competition was 70 shots, so I had 70 opportunities to be the best that I could be, and that was my goal. Um, you know, for many years in my sports career, up until here, uh, I always struggled with self-belief. Um, you know, I was always assailed by a lot of anxiety in this process, uh, um, and after Athens, I gave up on this yeah, because my of, question uh, was, my next question to you was going to be, at what point did it become, there's a point when you enjoy what you do yeah. and then there's a point when it starts becoming pressure and you don't even realize sometimes. Yeah. So it's, it's probably the Athens experience that made you realize that. Yeah, I think uh, it's all about balance as well. I think my best years as an athlete uh, were uh, when I was a student athlete because, you know, I had certain amount of hours to focus on my shooting and I had a certain amount of hours I had to study and do other things and that when that journey ended I suddenly had more time uh, and I started to put all my eggs in one basket and that was perhaps uh, my biggest mistake in my sports career. Uh, I did ach happen to achieve uh, my goal but I certainly did not uh, achieve my full potential and now that I look back at my sports career I think the greatest limiting factor was that I lost this balance uh, after 2004. Yes, I won a gold medal, but I believe that I could have done much better. Uh, I did achieve goals, but definitely uh, did not achieve my truest potential. And that was A, because I put all my eggs in one basket, um, I lost balance, uh, and I did not prioritize my own human well-being. Um, I did a lot of work. I put in a lot of effort to improve as an athlete and become better as an athlete. But I did not prioritize my own human well-being. Uh, and if I had taken better care of my own self, I believe I would have come closer uh, to achieving my truest potential. On the day when you won your medal, and, um, did you ever want to attempt doing it again 
what was your what was your sort of goal or target after that yeah. so the moment i won my gold medal and i went back to my coach my first sentence to my coach and i don't know if many people even know about it was that i'm never going to shoot again it killed me so much to win that gold you medal you knew that instant yeah that was my first reaction, reaction. uh because it took so much out of me i mean it was so tough i mean uh, as i said we are good actors and you know everybody the whole country thought i was this calm human being but you don't know what I was happening inside I was uh, close to death um, I had never seen myself so alive with my heart pounding uh, at almost 200 beats per minute and I was not even moving I was and I was uh, supposed to stand as still as death um so all that adrenaline all that stress to perform in that moment was was just draining um and yes it, I think uh, that moment was of course thrilling uh, because a I firstly did not even know that I had won uh because for me the greatest uh, victory was that i was able to do the best that i could do uh and and that was to me personally the more the most important thing the gold medal or a medal at the olympics was was secondary um so it was a thrill to just to been able to shoot the 10 best shots uh, of my life when it was needed the most right. uh so that was the thrill but it was also very draining my batteries were completely out and completely i was in on the negative part of my duracell battery as i call it and uh, yeah i think uh, of course the first day was a lot of thrill you know winning brought in that extra adrenaline uh, but uh, from the next morning it was just tough i was just lost uh, i had uh, this gold medal that i had chased for 16 years up until then in my pocket um and i was just uh, all dressed with nowhere to go i was just lost there was a great void that this um victory created because my life was only oriented till that one moment i had all for for so long in my life i had gone to bed with a dream that i want to win a gold medal at the, at the olympic games and every, every morning i would wake up working to try and achieve that yeah, goal yeah. and suddenly you've got that got that what? now what and it took a while it took a long time to to really understand myself uh, and that's where when i went to that vipassana course where i was the goal was really to think of my next calling i actually when i went into vipassana where i have to meditate for 10 hours a day and wake up at 3 in the morning and start meditating and all i did for 10 days uh, of my um, we passed on course was think about shooting and how i could improve and that just gave me a realization that i just loved the process of what i did um which i probably did not really recognize in the process uh but that experience just told me that i loved it and um, and that realization was just enough to bring in that energy again and bring in that healing that was needed uh and that self realization to happen to find a goal again to find direction again uh, and then suddenly i had it and then things became better but it took a while it took a good year and a half to really get out of it and uh, uh, get my balance of sort back you know a lot of athletes include including me have been guilty and continue to be guilty in believing in an equation and that equation is uh, that a gold medal equates happiness yes but uh, in reality we have to learn to reverse that equation and make happiness our gold medal uh, and that was a process of of learning as well you know the beijing gold medal taught me something rudely which was that okay it was a great outcome but it did not make me happier right, yeah. um and i started looking life uh, differently yeah. at life differently i started uh, also um patting myself on the back a little bit on smaller achievements on smaller goals that i set uh, along the way um though that was very very important uh, uh part of that journey uh, prioritizing my self care uh, to get enough rest and recovery you know i kept you know abusing myself in many ways throughout my career and that was um, you know i disrespected my talent and that was because i gave it too much uh, you have to find that balance again you know you uh, the secret to optimum performance or peak performance as many people call it is finding that uh, i wish my husband was here to listen to this <laughs> it is a little bit uh, like a relationship with your girlfriend i tell people <laughs> not too far but not too close <laughs> the 
definition of success kept changing through the course of my journey. As a young boy, success was, meant that I would get famous. It was a way to uh, create an identity of my own. Um, but it was also about this whole thing about fame. But, you know, in sport, you're going to fail much more than you succeed. And after a couple of failures uh, came my way, <laughs> I soon realized that this is not going to work. And I'm not, uh, that's not going to be my definition of success. Now that I have exited my investment of sorts and can look back at my career a little bit more dispassionately, uh, you know, I look back at, his, at success, at the relationships that I was able to build uh, through the course of my career. I look at uh, the whole journey as a success on its own. It is not the gold medal which was the, pro which was the success. It is the process, what that gold medal m made me as a, as a human being, as an individual, the values that I could imbibe through sport. Of course, it, uh, it ta taught me how to win, but more importantly, sport taught me how to lose. Um, you know, it taught me how to work hard. It taught me how to have a goal. It taught me, um, you know, how to deal with conflict, how to deal with people who I liked, who, are, who I did not dislike, but it, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the greatest learning of her life and, and that to me as I look back was the greatest success of those 22 years. The, of course there were outcomes but the outcomes are on a wall, my medals are hanging on a wall but all these learnings that I had through sport and the values that I could imbibe through sport will stay with me forever and that for me has been my greatest, uh, greatest success and all what I do in life post my sport career will always be um, you know, driven through those values and, and that I imbibed um, on the field of play. Gosh, I feel like <laughs> stealing words from my mouth. But I say this all the time that I know my, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an actor by profession, but I think like an athlete. And I feel like when you play sport, it changes your life forever. It could be, uh, you know, you could have played just recreationally, you could have played sport professionally. But what you learn uh, in those years, I don't think anything else in life really teaches you that. And um, uh, exactly like he said, it's taught me how to handle success. Uh, it's taught me how to handle failure. Um, and I don't think I'd be able to do what I do today if I hadn't had all of those experiences. And what does success mean to me at that age? Like he said, at, at that age you want to be famous, you want, uh, you want to be interviewed, you want to see uh, you know, your, your pictures flashed everywhere, uh, you want money, you want to be financially independent in a different way. You, you, you know. And you hear of names in various fields of successful people and you aspire to be that. Um, and then as you go on on that journey, you realize that success means different things to different people and uh, you know today for me success is to be able to be present. I think it's absolutely uh, it's not a sign of uh, weakness at all to uh, seek help it's actually very very empowering I experienced it myself uh, and I would just encourage each and everybody who it's not feeling their best to go out and, and, and seek help. I think uh, it's a real sign of courage and it's a real sign of strength. If you think an athlete's life will be, will be devoid of pressure, then you're living in a dream. Right. There will be pressure, there will be stress. But how do you learn to channelize it? Um, so I had to work my through, way through a few therapists and uh, just find that way and that harmony and, and strike that relationship with somebody who I started to trust. Um, uh, that was a process and um, when I found that, that was again something which was incredibly uh, empowering uh, for me to just have to be able to bear myself naked in, in front of my therapist and, and talk about my vulnerabilities and um, I, when I was, you know, initially I thought it was limiting but when I started doing it, uh, it was actually very empowering. I felt much stronger when I came out of a session. And you start discovering different facets of yourself uh, as well. Absolutely. While you're on this uh, yeah. journey. And absolutely. And uh, another very incredible thing happened in that process was, you know, you know, I'm, I'm called to many places to, to speak. speak. Uh, and all I go and talk about uh, is my vulnerabilities. And I see people now really uh, resonating with it because, you know, 
they can relate to some yeah. parts of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, who cares if I did so many sit-ups or did so much core training to become <laughs> more stable to or reduce my heart rate or get my respiratory rate lower. It was great, but it won a gold medal, but how does it help them? So I really go and talk about uh, my vulnerabilities. Uh, and I'd like to talk about my, my greatest vulnerabilities was with belief. Uh, because I had uh, so become uh, so obsessive, um, and I was a perfectionist of sorts and chasing perfection is a good thing but it's also a really bad thing because chasing perfection is like chasing an uh, untamable beast. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and, um, you know, I never gained confidence. You know, I would shoot perfect scores, break world records in, in practice but my reaction out of breaking a world record was, oh, but I could have done, done that a little bit better. So I gained absolutely no confidence and it was just tough, it just brought in so much anxiety uh, and I was never happy. I was never happy with uh, what, I was, what I was doing and it was, that was toxic. Uh, but there was a shift mm, um, and that was limiting in performance as well, right? I was used to be so scared going into competition. I, know I was always a little chicken hearted but uh, this even made it worse. Uh, but there was a shift and the decisive shift was when I stopped chasing self-belief and I started chasing self-respect. Right. Uh, and for me, the most important thing was to be the best that I could be um, when nobody was watching, uh, when there were no lights and cameras on me. But I woke up every morning with the same enthusiasm and energy as I would uh, when competing in, a, in, in an Olympic final. And that was just a wonderful journey, which was so empowering. Uh, I would look, out, look myself into uh, the mirror every night uh, and ask myself the question, have I given it my best today? And when the answer was yes, uh, I always had a very good night's sleep. And I realized that hard work is the best possible sedative that you can ever get. And I tried a few, uh, I have to admit, over the course <laughs> of uh, uh, my career. Uh, but mm, hard work was the best sedative that you could get. And, you know, for example, when I embarked on my Beijing uh, Olympic adventure, um, you know, I looked myself into the mirror a couple of days before I took my flight uh, to Beijing and asked myself, have I given it my best in the last four years to be the best that I could be? And frankly, the answer was yes, I could have done humanly nothing more to prepare for this event. And even before I shot the first shot uh, at the Beijing Olympics, I was already a winner. I was a winner in my own eyes. And that was so um, empowering that gave me this, a sense of security from deep within. Uh, and that was that wonderful journey that I, I started to chase of, of, of self-respect. And um, for me, it's much better than self-belief. I, I mean, I think for me, we've, in the last, say, 10, 15 years, India has seen a, almost sort of a revolution when it comes to uh, physical health. Uh, but for some, somehow, we never give the same kind of importance to our uh, emotional well-being. Uh, and therefore, I think that um, I, there's absolutely no shame uh, or stigma in that. We've both had our experiences and um, it's okay to not be okay. Um, it's okay to talk about, um, I think for me, one of the biggest, I'd say, my journey to recovery really was to accept that there is such a thing as mental illness. Um, uh, so I think accepting it for myself, number one. Uh, two to be able to share my journey with the world, um, uh, with my family, with my friends and with the world and also to seek help. Uh, I think there's no shame or stigma in that. Uh, we do take care of our physical selves. The minute we're unwell, um, you know, we never think twice about speaking to a doctor or, or getting medical advice. So there's no reason why we shouldn't do that for our mind as well. You know, so I think you need your mind as much as you need your body and I think both of these things are extremely important and work hand in hand. You know, I talked a lot about the challenges of elite sport and uh, they, that ch the challenges elite sport potentially can have on mental health, but I haven't done a good job of talking about the positive role that sport can play in, 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 yes. in the role of mental health of society. Uh, and there I feel we are a very young country, a very young society, and 
we have to imbibe the values of sport. You know, mental health and your values uh, are so closely linked. You spoke so yes. well about the role that your parents played in your upbringing, which helped you deal with challenges. And that is exactly um, what sport can play a very meaningful role in, in nation building. You know, sport it teaches you how to win, it teaches you how to lose, it teaches you honesty, it teaches you integrity, it teaches you how to have a goal, uh, it teaches you to listen. We, we're, a, or we're a young country which has very short attention spans at this moment and uh, again very closely linked to mental health. Yes. Uh, so sport can be a great driver for positive uh, work on, on mental health. So I'd really love that sport plays a more meaningful role in our young society to imbibe these values that uh, are so important uh, uh, in life. You know, we're all after economic success uh, and, uh, you know, economic superiority and we talk about a $5 trillion economy. And it's very interesting because, you know, all the global economic superpowers are also uh, great sporting superpowers and I do believe that sport has had a very very meaningful role in all these great leaders and businessmen in, in, in their careers because they've all experienced sport, they've played sport as young kids uh, and they've imbibed certain values which they've taken uh, through in their life. Uh, so I do believe that we should use the power of sport uh, of course for the physical uh, health benefits that sport gives but also for the mental well-being uh, uh, of society in general. Of course, this is something very, that I'm very passionate about and, uh, you know, I had my own experiences with mental health and I wanted to use the opportunity that I have now to, uh, to help other athletes, uh, to set them at least on the right path or to at least help destigmatize the whole issue regarding uh, mental health. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to work with the International Olympic Committee and part of their Athletes Commission and part of the working group uh, on athlete mental health and we've done quite a lot of good work in the last couple of years to a, start to destigmatize mental health uh, also to create resources you know athletes are assessed every year physically but there's never been an assessment tool to assess athletes on their mental health so we actually sat down for two years and built an assessed credible medical assessment tool uh, to assess mental health uh, of athletes so now that is being uh, uh, used by many sports organizations across the world. We also have to build the ecosystem that surrounds the athletes. So we started a certification and diploma course specifically on athlete mental health uh, um, to sanitize the whole entourage that surrounds the athlete on, 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 on mental health. We've released a toolkit uh, as well, so that's the work of the IOC that uh, I've dedicated a lot of time and energy into and it is very, very gratifying. Uh, of course, through the foundation, my own foundation in India, we're uh, trying to create psychologically safe environments, working with a lot of organizations, uh, state governments, um, coaches, you know, they're, they're the real it's not just about the mental health of uh, athletes, it's a lot to do with the mental health of coaches uh, as well. They too need to be happy individuals uh, personally to, be, to, to foster positive environments. Um, so we're making our humble, I'm making my humble attempt and uh, again it's, it remains a passion. It's very gratifying to be able to give back in a little way um, and hopefully it helps. That's a perfect way to end this fascinating conversation. Special, special thanks to you, Abhinav, for accepting our invitation and speaking so passionately and honestly about your journey. It offered us a new perspective to measure success and reinforce the importance of well-being. Thank you, Deepika, for your presence, participation and constant drive to make a greater contribution. And thank you to our audience. Your support is heartwarming. Goodbye and see you at our next lecture.